My dearly beloved in Christ, the, the Sunday after Easter, the octave day of Easter, is one of the highest ranking Sundays throughout the entire year. Of course, last Sunday, the Feast of the Resurrection of our Lord is the most important feast, the greatest Sunday of the year. And second to that would be Pentecost Sunday in seven weeks, uh, seven weeks from Easter, which celebrates the birth of the church. But Low Sunday, because it is the octave day of Easter, is very important. And many people wonder, well, why is it called Low Sunday? That almost makes it seem like it's unimportant. That is only in relation to Easter. And in fact, in the early church, the catechumens would be baptized on Easter Sunday or at the Easter Vigil. And throughout the octave of Easter, they would wear white vestments. But they laid them aside at the end of the day, Saturday, yesterday, so that on the octave day on Sunday, they came to church, they came to attend Mass without wearing their white garments. And the other Christians, having seen these all week, it seemed like a uh, maybe a reason why they called it Low Sunday. At any rate, it is a very important Sunday, and the Gospel tells us about the first two apparitions of our Lord to his apostles. There were other apparitions to disciples, to the holy women, to St. Mary Magdalene in particular, to St. Peter. But the, today's gospel recounts the story of the first two apparitions of our Lord to his apostles gathered together in the upper room. The first was on Easter Sunday in the evening, and the second was the following Sunday, what would be today. The first time our Lord appeared, one of the apostles was not there, Thomas. And when he finally returned from his errands, the other apostles were telling him, we have seen the Lord. He came and stood in the midst of us, and this is what he said, and so forth. And Thomas remained obstinate. He said, I will not believe unless I myself can take my finger and put it into the hole of the nails in his hands and put my hand into the gash in his side, I will not believe. Now, why would he make that statement or that challenge? It must have been because the other apostles were permitted by our Lord when he appeared that evening of Easter Sunday to touch his hands and his feet to see the marks and it is interesting that of all the sufferings our Lord had endured in his passion, all of the terrible marks from the scourges and all the wounds, the only marks that he retained in his glorified body were what we call the five wounds, the, the nail holes in his hands and feet and the gash in his side from the spear. Our Lord retains those five wounds we shall see them in heaven, in his glorified body. And the gospel tells us that today that our Lord came through the walls, through the doors, into the upper room. The doors were shut because in his glorified body, our Lord was not tied down to physical laws. Even though, of course, as God, he could do whatever he wished. But in his glorified body, he was not subject to the laws of physics. Another interesting detail that is not mentioned by St. John in today's Gospel, I believe it is in St. Matthew's Gospel, is that when our Lord appeared on the evening of the resurrection for the first time to the apostles gathered together, they were stunned and they thought maybe they were seeing an apparition, that it wasn't really his body. Even though the holy women had told them that they had seen our Lord, that he had risen from the dead. And so to, you might say, condescend to their difficulty in believing, our Lord said, do you have anything here to eat? And the evangelist says they offered him a piece of broiled fish and, and a piece of honeycomb. And our Lord ate them to show that it was truly his body that it wasn't just an appearance, that he had truly risen from the dead. But getting back to today's gospel, Thomas remained obstinate, unbelieving. 
And finally, one week later, on what we would call Low Sunday, the following Sunday, our Lord appeared again. And this time, all of them were there, including Thomas. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, come here and put your finger into the mark of the nails and put your hand into the wound in my side and be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas said those words which we are encouraged by Holy Mother Church to use at the consecration, my Lord and my God. But I have always found it consoling the words that our Lord said after that. Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because now you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And my dear friends in Christ, that is us. We have not seen our Lord as the apostles did. He condescended to their weakness because they were going to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth of the resurrection. And so it was necessary that they become firmly convinced of the truth, the fact of his resurre the resurrection of his body from the dead. But there are many things we don't see, and yet we believe. The real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, for example. And it isn't it consoling to think that we have a great, reward in heaven by believing what we can't see, what our senses don't convince us of, but it's, it's rather the gift of faith that helps us to accept these truths. Faith is a gift. It is something we must pray for. We must pray for a stronger faith. Pray for those who do not have faith, that they will receive the gift of faith. And let us never take it for granted. It is a gift that must be exercised. We must practice our faith so that we don't endanger the loss of faith and be ever grateful for this wonderful gift of faith. As we celebrate the resurrection, let us also call to mind the words of St. Paul in today's epistle to the Colossians, where he says that Actually, I believe it was the epistle, excuse me, from last Sunday of St. Paul to the Colossians. And he says, if Christ be risen from the dead, then we ought to dwell with him, so to speak, in heaven. He says to the early Christians, if you be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above. Don't mind the things of earth, but mind the things that are above. And this is really for us. The lesson of the resurrection is having gone through the season of Lent, practicing penance, giving up things we enjoy, doing penance. And then the resurrection comes, the feast of the resurrection of our Lord. We should have risen from a life centered perhaps more on ourselves, our own likes and dislikes, our own appetites, to rise to a more spiritual way of living. This is really what true Christianity is, constantly seeking, as St. Paul says, the things that are above, seeking to be with Christ forever. So we must become less attached to material things, less busy and attentive, dwelling on and seeking after material things. And yes, we have necessary preoccupations. I shouldn't say preoccupations, but necessary attention to paying our bills, earning a livelihood, providing for yourself and your family the things you need, food, clothing, a home, shelter, and so forth. There are necessary concerns, but we must not become preoccupied with these concerns. Rather, our preoccupation should be with spiritual things. Seek the things that are above, St. Paul says, not the things that are below. And our whole life is looking forward to an everlasting happiness in heaven. And as we reflect upon the resurrection, let us remember what we say in the Apostles' Creed. Every day when we say the Creed or the Nicene Creed at Mass, I believe in the resurrection of the body and of life everlasting. Our bodies also will one day rise from the dead and we will be with our Lord. If we have lived our faith, we will be with him for all eternity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.